there we go. Thanks for being on the podcast, Brad. No worries. So, yeah, man. So how's the temperature up there? Ah, you know what? Last week was full on summer. So yeah. in, in Canada talk, it was like 30. So just warm, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And it's right back down to spring. It actually kind of feels like fall right now. Yeah. Like wow. Yesterday, I was like, I'm not yesterday. Last week, I was like working out back, right? Had the yeah. computer out, like suntanning. And I'm, I'm like inside the hoodie today, so. Yeah. No, Where I'm, you- in, I'm in Michigan. We have the same. It's yeah. Like, rain gloom and then it's like ah and then you're like no please yeah come back you have just enough that you're like this is going to be awesome and then yeah it takes it away from you exactly so is that that rain and gloom did that drive you at the beginning into fitness or where was where's the start of your fitness no no fitness for me came um it's actually (laughs) almost directly related back to lou frigno and Um. lou frigno had a tv show he was the incredible hulk in like pre-CGI in Criminal Hulk days. And, uh, you know, for some reason, he was David Banner, not Bruce Banner. And he would transform into the Incredible Hulk. I don't know, it was probably some really? legal issue or something. Yeah. And, you know, as a little kid watching David Banner, who wasn't overly meek by any means, but transform into the Hulk. And it was just something about that. And I just remember, like, talking to my dad and being like, how do they do that? And my dad's like, it's just a really big guy painted green. And I'm like... Dude looks like that, like for real, right? And that's like before Arnold, before Jean Claude Van Damme. For me, it was like Lou Ferrigno, just the the idea, the metamorphosis, right? Is the the change. Awesome. And then I was always small, like really, really, um, both in stature and and just skinny. So I think that drives you towards a how you fix that problem, and you get driven more towards learning about the physiology and nutrition of it, right? So if you're a natural athlete. You just get driven towards the, um, you know, do X, get result Y, be better mm-hmm. at sport Z. But if you're not doing that, then, you know, you're just kind of sitting there going, but why? Why does yeah. you a better football player? I need to know the why because I'm never going to actually test it and go out in that field, mm-hmm. right? So I'm going to work on the whys and, and, the, and the hows it works, right? So I think natural athletes just only care that it works. And then if you're not athletic in any nature and you're not ever going to be on the field, you, you, your choice is to focus on the why. So that, that was my Lou Frigno and then sort of driven me into the, the whys of it all is what got me into it. That's awesome. So do you have any like Hulk tattoos anywhere in your body? Or no, like- no, no tattoos. I do somewhere in the basement though have an original Incredible Hulk lunch pail. Like the oh, full yeah. old school like tin ones. Yeah. yeah. And he was just, he was in I Love You Man not too long ago also. Yeah. He yeah. still makes his appearances back and forth. Yeah. But. I think he did a Marvel. It might have even been one of the Incredible Hulk movies. Um, he mm. did a couple appearance in that one, too. Still a massive man, right? Like oh, my God. A lot of space. Yeah. Those, there's, like, there's certain people like him, Arnold, and those guys that like when you see them in real life, you're just like, is that really possible? Yeah. It's like, so broad, right? And then because Lou was tall, too, right? So he just – so much space taken up, like a, a professional athlete to the nth degree, right? Exactly, yeah. Because they're more athletic. He's more like, boom. Yeah, just mass everywhere. So that led you to then expanding on the physiology and learning the nutrition. Yeah. Is that around the time when you started to look at fasting? And was that spurred by yoga or just more of Oh, okay, yeah, no. So I went um, I hardcore – uh body i really only cared about muscle at first right and for me at 15 16 17 that age like the fat loss wasn't really an issue yeah. to begin with so but it led me into the um young know-it-all phase and so i ended up getting a job at a supplement shop right and i was the guy behind the counter you know upselling you vitamin c with your protein yeah. and all that kind of stuff but that really got me into that was in the 90s right so kind of we're talking muscle and fitness leading with the way for muscular development muscle media magazines where the magazines started talking a bit more about the science and so that got me into the the real academic side of it so i did my undergrad in applied human nutrition mm-hmm. and that got me like really really into the nutrition side of it more than the training side of it i was you know interested in yeah. that that got me into working in the supplement industry i did six seven years working r d in the supplement industry oh Even really yeah, came out of that to do my grad work. And it wasn't until 
uh, doing my grad work. So at like, and this is like, I was a late grad student. So I was maybe 29, 30 years old, um, way back in like 2005. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started looking into fasting only because we were looking at sort of the, um, you know, the pillars that make the perfect diet. And to start, we wanted to look at what would happen if you didn't eat. And you know all the oh. happen when you don't eat, right? Because <laughs> I grew up in bodybuilding and then I went from there into supplements. So I knew, like, if you didn't eat every two hours, you basically died, yeah. right? It was a horrible death too, right? Well, so, yeah. Or you're homeless. Yeah, one of, one of the two, just like that, right? And so for me, it was a very obvious, okay, if you don't eat every so often, all you lose all your muscle and you actually get fatter, we'll just we'll lay that down and then I'll build off of that. Looking at the research, I realized oh, I actually have no clue what I'm talking about, like at all, right? Like, and so a bit of a crossroads where I could either just keep ignoring all that research or I could dive into it and chose to dive into it. So that's where the fasting came from, was the sort of realization that uh, for the last 20 years, I had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> and then that brings the rabbit hole of, hey, what everything that everybody's talking about is yeah. incorrect. Yeah, you know, you really not to be your conspiracy theorist tin hat person but you really realize how much the industries mm -hmm. whether supplements or, or or food or any component of food have in spinning not necessarily the research i, I still believe the majority of the research is done well but yeah. spinning the story from the research right so mm -hmm. you can only make profit as a supplement company or a food company by getting people to obviously take your stuff but then they either have to take more of it or take it more often so you have yeah. to have reasons to have more or have reasons why you should not only have your protein after your workout, but before your workout, also before you go to bed and first <laughs> right? yeah. they make them consume more. Yeah. And, and that really plays a role in, in how we view uh, nutrition research, right? Because we, we're trying to look for, well, we're not sure. A lot of people are trying to look for reasons to use that research to prove the more theory. Yeah. And not many people are looking at the research uh, to be like, no, let's, let's figure out why to eat less because we want people to buy less of our stuff, right? So, totally. yeah. yeah. And especially I, in 05, you know, back then it was fasting just wasn't heard of really from this point. So it was kind of been an uphill story there. Yeah. So we'll get into one of the questions I always ask is what you're questioning. So you can put the tin hat back on. Nice. Um, but, you know, I agree 100% with... Um, I love looking at things from the concept of evidence of absence or like, what can I find that you don't need to do? And that's what things are pointing to. Yeah. I think like with the research, a lot of times they skew the titles. I'll, I'll see that a lot of times. Titles. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also we, not we, a lot of people typically find the research from the press release. Hmm. So the press release, though, has already skewed you on what the research has found. So then if you, even if you go from the press release, you're like, that's awesome. I'm actually going to download the full paper and read it. Yeah. You're reading it because you've been told it found something. And even though it may not have found exactly that, you, you've yeah. always been preconditioned. So it is, it's very difficult to remain unbiased. And then even for me, I mean, if I make a living now on writing about fasting, my bias is towards a positive effect of, of fasting so you really have to constantly blinders on read what's in front of you and then figure out what's going on but yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be tricky yeah but you've now since expanded into a lot more realms you have see the protein myth you're yep. talking about i mean one of the biggest myths especially if you dove into bodybuilding and stuff at 17 and you were the know-it-all at the gnc then you're like yeah, it's just like, I don't know, take your body weight, multiply it by two. That's the amount of protein that you should yeah, have. Exactly, exactly, right? But, and it's a hard one too because it's, when it comes to muscle building, the, the main issue we have is a much larger amount of people than we'd like to admit are on some sort of performance enhancing drug. And since there's a stigma around that, instead of just saying, no, dude, I'm, I'm just on some test. It's like I'm eating lots and up my protein, right? And so yeah. that's, that's a <laughs> given. It tends to drive that thought process. So the, the protein one is really, really tricky for that because it's the easy out answer for yeah. maybe doing stuff that actually works, right? So Yeah, well, people correlate always protein with muscle and it's just like something that's been built over and over again. Like, oh, what do yeah. you do? Protein. I just, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's spiked protein from China that has a little bit of stuff in it. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. It's protein. Yeah, yeah but, no, so it... Let's dive a little bit more deeper into that because I know, I mean, you go like really into it with the nitrogen balance and a lot of like how 
the body really just doesn't need as much protein as we say. Right. Um, do you get as much into the quality of like if you're getting meat protein versus something else, or is it just more of like this is what you need to be a real person? Stop stressing. Yeah, that's more um, more my approach. The, not a lot of people like to l- look at like the perfect physique, right? You scroll on Instagram and you see your Nemea Delgados and those kind of people, right? And you're like, oh, I want to look like that. But in reality, most of us don't want to do what it takes to, to look like that. So just to help the average person look better, right? Lean, but not super, super, super shredded, right? Muscular, but not, I can't shop for shirts muscular. Yeah. I try to keep that focus and realize, okay, well then you do have to get enough protein. I'm actually blown away by the amount of people who, when I'm like outside of the fitness community, if I say, you know, roughly a hundred grams a day, the average person is like, how the hell am I going to do that? <laughs> like, Hundred hundred grams? Like, come on, we can do this, right? But it, it's funny because a lot of people aren't willing to compromise anything to do with their diet, right? So what, whatever they're eating right now, even though it's what's contributing to looking the way they don't want to look, mm-hmm. they don't want to necessarily change that, right? So I'm like, well, we just got to add some some higher protein foods to your diet if you're having. Like some people are like 35, 40 grams a day. I'm like, okay, I, I'd like you a little higher than that. Yeah. How about some scrambled eggs for breakfast? No, I don't like eggs. Okay, how about, uh, how about a protein shake? No, I don't like the taste. Ch- chicken, meat, too expensive. I'm like, okay, you know what? <laughs> like, I, yeah, I, seriously. You know, yeah, so I like to look at more, though, for the average, the average person and, and just trying to figure out what they're doing. The, the problem with protein is that if you look at it from just one angle, like I looked at specifically from muscle building, you, you get one pretty good answer. But then if you look at protein for its contribution to weight loss, you may get a different answer. And then if you're not thinking specifically some sort of hormonal benefit, but just a satiety effect, you might get a different answer again. So you also have to really careful what you say because, well, I'm saying for, for muscle growth for the average guy or girl, so average being, you know, you're not six foot six, you know, a hundred ish grams, 120 is, is probably enough. But if you're trying, if you're in a large calorie deficit, I may want you to have more. Right, because I wasn't assuming that you're gonna do something crazy like half your calories, right? So then maybe more because it, it might have a satiating effect or it might preserve lean muscle. But for the general person following an average diet, yeah, I, I think a hundred grams ish is best. And I think that the stressing over, you know, whether or not your whey was cold processed or micro filtered, <laughs> you know, New Zealand cow diet versus some other cow diet, you're sleeping, like I think you're yeah, worry about a lot of stuff you don't have to worry about, right? And you're just adding a crap ton of um, diet-induced stress to your life. Yes, it's probably counterproductive to what you're trying to accomplish. So, show, yeah. relax. Yeah, yeah, and that's something. The diet-induced stress is like massive because I've even had friends who like start fasting, and yeah. then they're like, "Dude, I'm doing like the craziest fast, and then I'm gonna do like every day the craziest fast," and I'm like you know that you're like the fasting is the freedom to eating how you want to eat. That's yeah. The, I like to think of it as fasting is a break from eating. Yeah. Right. Not, but a lot of people view it as eating is a break from their fasting. I'm like, it's, that's crazy. And yeah. I understand like there, there is some benefit to the longer fasts, right. Two, three days, mm-hmm. but you know, you understand there's some sort of relationship between the length of your fast and the frequency of the fasting. It, it seems very intuitive, right? That maybe the longer you fast and the longer you should wait till you do it again. But people are just kind of doing the whole, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do this until I burn out. And then I'm going to not do anything for a couple months, gain a bunch of weight. And then I'm going to try it again. And I don't understand why that's the idea that you won't burn out on it would kind of like be you and I thinking we're going to lose weight. So we're going to just start running now. And I'm going to stop running when I'm not the weight I want, right? And yeah. we know when we talk about it that way, that's ridiculous because I would make it halfway down my street and pass out. Yeah. Right? So I'm not going to be running for four and a half days straight, right? I'm not, you know, Forrest Gump. But when it comes to diet, we don't view that. Like, you, even if it's not fasting, you all of a sudden you're like, you know what? Screw it. 800 calories a day. That's it. All protein until I get lean. And you sit there going, like, dude, you're going to do that for maybe three days. And then you're not going to do it anymore. Like, there is a longevity approach to weight loss yeah it's a lot to lose weight like i'm it sucks that it seems like you can put it all on in one bad weekend in mexico but it, <laughs> it's 
you know, it's going to take three times the time you put it on to take it off. That's just a rough random figure in my head. Mm-hmm. Like it's, you got to go slow. Like you got to be consistent and make it work for you. And with fasting, especially and with almost everything to do with diet, people are like, no, I want it now. I want to fix this by Sunday. Right. So I never want <laughs> No, and it's always true the purpose behind it. Like I know people do longer fasts and it's more for the spiritual aspect. So they're not like, I'm going to get shredded. They're like, I'm going to like go super deep and like not worry about food. Yeah. I I think like. That's very different than I'm just not going to eat again until I look the way I want. (laughs) Yeah. It's a form of self-punishment, right? Like it's really what it comes down to is I'm thinking of different ways to punish myself because I'm not happy with the way I look. And that's a horrible approach to health and fitness because it's not really health or fitness. No. And you'll never get to where you want to be by doing that. That's the, it's the hardest thing to tell people. Like even a lot of the fit people, they're not in the shape. Physically, they may look good, but like internally and mentally, it's like, ugh, what's going on in there? Yeah, exactly. Right. And so it's, there is an important part to balancing it out. And then knowing your personality, there are hardcore warriors out there who will, measure everything and they will be yeah. disciplined and they will work out and their workouts will be like extreme and that fits their personality it's what they do and then but then they go and you know suggest that to everybody else and if you're you know anything like me you look at that and be like i'm i'm not gonna do that right, right? like there's no part yeah. of the intensity of your life that intrigues me and it's just like personality based so some people can handle it some can't and it's, i think it's when you start flipping that around that people get really out of their shell because they're kind of out of their own mind and it turns into neuroses and that kind of thing so yeah you gotta it has to be a balanced approach whether it's muscle gain whether it's it's fat loss and it has to be balanced for you right so some people are always going to be that you know alpha attack mode on it and that suits them but other people it won't and if you try to force them into that it really spirals down which is like a lot of this, uh, the social stuff we're seeing now, but also then you can't have your mint chocolate chip ice cream or you're getting exactly. it. And that's just for me, not worth it. Right. Like yeah, it's, it's, exactly. Yeah. So, so then you took a little turn and lately I've been seeing a lot of stuff about gut health. You've been yeah. really focusing yeah. on gut, how fructose interacts, how cold kills uh, fat cells. Yeah. Just everything I could find. It's not fasting. Um, Aesop eat was updated five, six times. So it came out in like late 2006. Mm-hmm. It was like at that time, 70 pages, double spaced font 12. Like it, yeah. was, it was, and then, you know, every year new research on fasting would come out and it would expand it and expand it. And now it, like the last time I did that was 2013, 14. I'm kind of happy where it's at. Um, and I'm not as interested in the hard, di- deep dives into pathways, et cetera, as much mm-hmm. as I'm sort of more what has to do with health. And I'm convinced that um, your health, uh, the amount of fat you carry, et cetera, is sort of multifactorial. No, totally. it's not. Yes, it is some sort of balance. If, if anything, it's, I think we can ignore calories and just say that if all food is carbon, your body fat is carbon. So yeah. it's carbon balance, right? So, okay, we've got that. Fine. Why? Right. So why is there a lack of balance then? Right. And that's more the direction I'm, I'm interested in now. So with the gut bacteria, it was kind of answering a simple question of you take a large group of people, you put them into a weight loss trial. They all lose weight. Awesome. But um, there's a standard deviation of like four or five pounds. So some lost three pounds, some lost 15. Mm. Why? So it's either... They just, they're all lying about how much they eat. And it's just, you know, human variability. Or maybe there's something else going on. And that's what kind of led me down the, okay, well, gut health is big right now, or becoming big, because it was years ago. Um, what do we know? And, and how much could that contribute to not necessarily um, weight loss on or off, but the variability in results. And so that's what led me down that path. And then um, sunlight and cold exposure um, CO2 in the air is, is really kind of playing off all the environmental factors. Yeah. I w- like not to go too crazy Canadian hippie on you, but like, if you look at the research, I, I basically think we should all be naked in the sun on the beach playing games. Right. And like, it, we need to be fit and moving around and playing tag and stuff. And we need to be exposed to some amount of sunlight, not enough to get a burn. We need lower CO2 levels. We need to be near water and seeing green. And that would be perfect. 
right? And I think it's, I, the stats I have is something along the lines of 98% of our time is spent inside. And so that, time inside, right? Wow. And, and then you look at it, so your, I'm in a decent, actually this room's got some decent lighting from windows, but the window, the glass blocks all the UV lights. Mm -hmm. All the what else it blocks, probably stuff on, we haven't discovered. But most of the time we're under artificial light inside, in this awful sitting position, like my hip flexors are shot, right? Like, the yeah. last thing you ever want to do is, is, is do grad work because then you, your hip flexors and your eyes are done. <laughs> right? It's horrible. But, yeah. you know, so we're not outside. The, this room is, is a, I'm actually in a spare bedroom right now. It's quieter. Uh, so it's a decent sized room, but I have the door closed. But I'm, I'm, I'm basically rambling incoherently right now. So mm -hmm. the CO2 levels in this room are, are constantly climbing way higher than they are outside. People are worried about, you know, CO2 levels hitting 400 yeah. in the So This room's probably 800. It's gonna be easily over 1,000 by the time this interview's done, right? All of that contributes to my health. It's not just whether or not, you know, my lunch is gonna be organic or not, right? Or how much protein, carbs, and fats are gonna be in it. All of this kind of plays a role. And I think that admitting proof of concept that things like even cold exposure can affect the amount of fat cells in your body allows you to then admit, okay, it might not just be diet and exercise, right? Mm -hmm. Like well, obviously these are huge contributing factors and they're almost like building block type stuff, but there's other stuff going on we, we need to be aware of. And I, I think I've done my part with, you know, uh, fasting. Yes. <laughs> in 2006, I mean, you've got, you know, before that, yeah, I think you had like Ori Hoffmeyer. Yeah. Like Martin and I come out in 2007. Mm -hmm. I think it's done, right? Like I think that there's there's enough people who that torch has been passed to. Yeah. I don't need to be constantly writing about it any, anymore. So um, I'm free to explore other things. And I think that the science behind the actual exercise mm has -hmm. come such a long way. You really need to be an expert in that specific field. Like you really need to know, you know, the dynamics of the bench press down to like, you know, I did my piece. <laughs> like it's just <laughs> yeah, and balance. And um, and I think nutrition for a large part is we have a very good basis, basic understanding of the large scale. And I think the deep dives in nutrition are coming up weak to tell you that you honestly when you really dive deep in nutrition, you get a lot of data with a lot, without a lot of applicability. So I think these broader topics are areas that we really do need to explore there because they remind me of fasting. And in 2006, like I, I was the complete whack job for writing about fasting, yeah. right? Like, it was just wrong. It wasn't even like, it wasn't a debate. I was just wrong, right? And so I think a lot of these other areas that when you start writing about it and people look at you like you're absolutely crazy, kind of lets you know that maybe that's the direction you should be looking. So. Oh. Yeah, it, 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 it's also more fun, to tell you the truth, is looking at new areas. Like you and I were talking about before, yeah. trying to find those connections. That's, that's the fun part for me, is finding weird connections and then expanding on them. Totally. Yeah, I think, so I want to address two of the, well, I guess it's kind of three. Sunlight, yeah. um, I'm like a huge proponent of at least 20 minutes a day, because I know that's the baseline. Yeah. But it, again, it depends on like where you live close to the equator. There's yeah. like so many factors. And with the glass and um, I did a little research on uh, eyesight and how they're like, whatever the amount of light you're supposed to get, they're like if you don't get that amount, which is equivalent to like two hours of like seeing in sunlight a day, mm -hmm. that's when these kids are getting myo myopia and like their vision starts to get bad because the muscles are locking up because they're not strengthening. Yeah. I was weird. You're talking, I was just thinking last week, I'd, um, I'm a huge sunglass guy. Yeah, always have money. I love, I love, but I'm also really bad at losing my sunglasses. What color eyes do you have? Blue. Okay. Yeah, like a really awesome, sexy blue. No, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I lost my sunglasses, and I could barely function. And I said, at what point did I get to the? Well, at what time did I get to the point where I could barely walk outside without mm -hmm. gray bands on? Yeah. And it made, to your point, made me think of like, did I have I lost the ability to you know? contract the pupil enough or I don't know what was going on so I've gone a couple of weeks 
without my sunglasses, uh, partially as an experiment, partially because I, I really yeah. have no clue where I put them. Like none, like I, <laughs> I think I left them somewhere. <laughs> but I'm finding that's kind of startling. Um, yeah, so the, the eye part, I'm not as um, well read in that, but I, I, I'm there with you because I'm just experiencing that myself right now. Totally, yeah, I've read some, they call it a light deficiency. Huh. And uh, with the eyes, um, I was reading, do you know Ray Peters? He's got some contrarian viewpoints, Um, but some of his stuff he was talking about uh, that over time. So, because I lived in Florida for two years and I did go without sunglasses the whole time. Right. It literally took like exposure and exposure and exposure. And then I could see clearly always uh, day after day in the sunlight. Uh, Yeah, it was super weird. But uh, so with CO2, I saw you were doing experiments while you were sleeping, seeing the uh, co2 levels um and i recently just had on uh patrick mcgowan of the oxygen advantage i don't know if you've heard of that book i haven't read any so there's a bunch of breathing books and a bunch of oxygen books Mm -hmm. i chose not to read them until i was done my the book on co2 Mm -hmm. just to make sure i wasn't sort of biased by that literature and now i'm going to bring it in now that i've done that work so he's it's very interesting because he's uh you know pottinger's cats uh, the Weston A. Price. Yeah. So uh, he's actually linking processed food and a few of that. Um, he doesn't know if it's chicken or the egg, but to uh, mouth breathing. Okay. And with mouth breathing, you're giving off the CO2 within you. Um, whereas the nose is uh, controlling the humidity, the amount of CO2 that comes out. Um, and so he pushes a lot for that, for an internal, uh, for higher internal CO2 based on nose breathing. Okay. My, my work was primarily on um, so CO2 exposure in the air. So not necessarily um, uh, blood levels of, of the, well, the carbonic acid and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Just exposure to CO2 in the air and its role in um, exhaustion, fatigue. Mm. And, and the idea there was um, all the good intentions to go work out are great. And all the intentions to eat well are awesome. But if you get home and after being in your house for half an hour or just tired and lethargic, you're probably not going to go work out. You're probably going to lay on the couch. And if you're laying on the couch, you're probably going to eat. So it was looking at why are we tired all the time? Is it really just our jobs all suck, right? Like, if, well, no, it could be. It could be a contributing factor. Yeah. But I started looking into what's called um, thick office syndrome. And it, it, what happens is, especially, well, Michigan, right, is where you are? Yeah, yeah. Michigan, Canada. We're not, in the Caribbean and places like that, houses are designed for airflow. Where we live, houses are designed to be airtight, like literally Mm -hmm. airtight, because as my dad would say, he's like, we're not heating the neighborhood, close the door. It's kind of like, you you want to (laughs) heat in during winters, and during summers, you want to keep your air conditioning in, right? So everything is like sealed tight. Um, And so what happens there is offices that are sealed tight with a bunch of people breathing, and we give off CO2, the CO2 levels will start to climb. And the higher the CO2 levels, the more those um, workers report headaches and migraines and lethargy, and the higher you see sick days, people not showing up for work, and you see productivity going down. Mm. And I took that, and I'm like, well, that's the way it is in offices. It's probably that way in homes. And then I started thinking, well, geez, I mean, between your office and your house, where else do you go? Would you just your car to get back and forth, right? Which is even smaller. Yeah. So 98% of your time is indoors and, and not, we're not talking elevated CO2 levels, like, you know, global warming. It's gone from 300 to 350. Like my, my bedroom will regularly be 1500. Right. That's, that's high. Um, most of my house, I battle here uh, to keep it below 800. I can usually get it in the six and sevens. Right. When I actually, I, I travel with a CO2 meter because that's, how big of a geek I am. Um, oh, that's awesome. when yeah, when I'm in the Caribbean, like it's 300, 305 would be the entire house, right? So you're exposed to that all the time because it's got this crazy airflow. And that kind of got me thinking about a lot of people when they talk about vacations and how they're relaxed and, you know, not, not a binge drinking in Mexico vacation, but like a true Vegas. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, they, they could slow down and this, it, they felt so rejuvenated. I'm like, I wonder how much of that is the sunlight and the CO2 levels. But really, the connection between the air you breathe and your physiology is, is sound. And it's people don't want to think about it because you can't see it. 
yeah. right? It's not like food you have this control over, right? And, or, or what you're drinking or your exercise, right? It's this thing that you can't see. You can't really taste. You can't really smell, right? Because even if your house does smell, you get used to it, right? Like people who have cats don't, don't smell the cat litter the same way someone without cats does, right? Uh, yeah. So you're just constantly exposed to it. But you're breathing all day, right? Yeah. And if you're not, you get bigger problems, right? So controlling things to CO2 levels, almost for me, your environment's like step one. Right? Because you can say, I'm going to, starting Monday, I'm Brad, I'm going to eat awesome, I'm going to exercise. But if you're constantly exhausted with a borderline headache because CO2 levels are high in your house, the chances of you then getting up off your butt and going to the gym are, are, are lessened. Right? And the chances of you eating more, because that's what we do in sort of stress anxiety states, are increased for most of us. So controlling that one little part of your environment it could be sort of the, the turning point to actually starting to be able to live an active yeah. lifestyle. Um, I think it's also why we see uh, strong seasonal effects on um, exercise activity, fat, weight, mm -hmm. BMI, et cetera. It might be just removing yourselves from these like contained CO2 environments to being spending more time outdoors or even just having windows open in your house. Yeah, yeah so that is massive it, it's so big and that's not even touching on like i specifically didn't go into breathing techniques yeah. or um, oxygen levels or air pollutants right so we have that whole area to discover as well so it's, it's it's just sitting there waiting for someone smarter than me to really expand it right so i mean there. you have brake dust in the air if you're in a city you have noise pollution yep. it's crazy that there's all these like people don't think they have control over factors like that but Opening a window isn't hard. No, you know and the messed up part is even in a downtown city centers, like you open your window and you're probably getting, believe it or not, better air than your house. Yes. Insane, right? So now, I mean, if you want to go all out, spending a little bit of money on air purifiers in your house is probably not a bad idea, right? And it's funny because I'll, you know, people will, what did I just do? I did a bit of a binge uh, online shopping and I bought like a, a couple of different bars for working out for like, couple hundred bucks yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. That, right but when i'm shopping for an air filter i'm like it's the cheapest one is right like yeah. i just grab this for the furnace and and but those things really really matter but we don't want to think about them in terms of health and fitness and i, I really view i mean the air you breathe and, yeah. and you know now there's a connection directly between not only your your lungs and your blood is obvious but your lungs and your gut bacteria there's a direct connection there mm -hmm. and but we the, we don't want to view the lungs as the same level of importance as we view um, your GI tract or, or your liver in terms yeah. of um, overall health and fitness. And it's ridiculous. So that's one that I'm going to keep beating the drum on. I'm, I'm honestly, to be honest, I'm not getting very far with it, right? Like the idea that CO2 is um, possibly linked to weight gain. People are sitting there going like, oh, Jesus, P1, what are you doing? Right? But I, it's, I think it's really important to at least, you know, the more – the more you can get that idea into people's heads, the more they'll look into it, the more the, the data can yeah. explain. But it's, it's very important to me because I, the idea that it's passive. Yeah. So, you know, if you're living in a, a dorm in university or you're living at your, your parents' house, you have no control over this stuff. When, if you're getting paid to go to an office and you're supposed to be there by nine and leave at five and your cubicle is in this one corner, yeah, you can't just tell them. Look, I'm a little concerned with CO2 levels. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna work here today. Like it's, you, a lot of people are trapped on those issues, right? And you know, telling someone that you're concerned about the CO2 levels in your office is a good way to be labeled the like the whack job. Yeah. Which is fine if you're an entrepreneur, but not so good if you're an employee, right? See, so yeah, that's the hard part. But then you look at offices like what Google has. Or no, I'm, I'm sure the CO2 levels are tightly monitored in Google. In fact, if anybody works at Google, I'd love to hear about that. But I bet you it's like they've got it down to a specific range right so well they had that or no it was maybe it was apple i remember like five years ago tim ferris put out a post and it was like the crazy coffee thing that the thinkers at apples you uh, use and it was like a thirty thousand dollar process to for their coffee to be right while they sat and thought about their next product it was something ridiculous yeah but hey yeah so but yeah, i don't doubt they've got the air tightly measured. I, you know who else I think has the air tightly measured? Casinos in Vegas. 
I think that the last wow. thing I'm really tired and, and want to go to bed, right? So I, I would bet, <laughs> Vegas, bet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But I would bet the CO2 levels in, in the Mandarin are, are fairly low. That yeah. is Perfect. totally. I mean, it's just like when we think about the military and we're like, they created the internet and all this stuff. There's a lot of places that are probably like, they know this stuff. Yeah. But like, it's not tested or put into practice anywhere else yet. And I think sunlight, CO2, like yeah. getting outdoors, stepping on the ground with your actual feet because we're humans yeah. and we're supposed to be in connection with all that. It, we have control and it's so important. It is. Even just going for a walk, you know, and I, I think in, um, Thin Air is, is the name of the book on CO2, which I've been mm. thinking about renaming to the air you breathe and why you should care. But so if you see either one, it's the same thing. Yeah. I was saying one of the things I'd love for people to do is act like smokers. Because what used to really bug me uh, when I worked like in an office was the smokers were perfectly allowed to every couple, you know, 15 minutes go outside for seven minutes smoke break. Yeah. But I couldn't just go outside and stand outside for seven minutes and then come back in. But you should, right? You should act just like a smoker. Because every half hour, you should just go outside, stand outside for five minutes, have a conversation. Not the water cooler, go outside. Yeah. And then come back in, you'd be better. You'd be more productive. You, you would actually get more out of your workers if you force them to do that than force them to stay in their office the whole time, right? Or in their cube. Yeah. You know, it'd be interesting to measure, and I don't know if you did this, when employee size increases in an office that's staying the same size, does employee dissatisfaction increase? Yeah, there, there's of no, that. The, the data on that um, and their environmental engineering papers are all about um, workplace. And they actually, mm -hmm. that's where the, the, the large amount of that, I mean, I joke that the information in the, the book I wrote is, if you're an environmental engineer, you'd sort of be going like, this is like first year crap, right? Like everybody knows this. And I'm like, no, no one knows. Only you and your friends know this, right? Exactly. But yeah, so they have a lot of control in the amount of, um, space per employee in the cubic feet right so the height as well and and ventilation requirements per person and you can take it right down to the you know sort of the legal limits versus optimal limits for actual productivity they actually have uh, similar data in school rooms right so wow. again so um a school down in florida you might be windows open yeah but schools in michigan and canada during february's it is like locked down airtight Right, so you have, and little kids are like, um, proportionately their metabolic rates are, are higher per yeah. person, per thing, right? So they're just spelling CO2 like crazy, right? Because, you know, they, they just played a giant game of manhunt at recess or whatever it is. Yeah. They come in and sit and doing math and they're still like breathing crazy. So you, you can only imagine those measurements. Um, we have measured CO2 levels in classrooms um, just by taking the CO2 unit with us. And they've luckily been lower in some schools. So some schools do have good air supply, but I imagine not all do, right? So. No, and I would imagine that's a contributing factor both to, and again, this is like uh, correlation, not causation, I would say. But um, the teachers feeling slower, they're always tired, lethargic. But then the one kid who has the energy yeah. is then labeled ADD because yeah. he's got the normal regulatory system everybody else, everybody else is like this is so, why is jimmy running around doing yeah. laps and that and was one thing i wanted to make clear is i think different people have different sensitivities to the co2 so um my wife is more prone to headaches mm. uh, when and it's you can just basically if the co2 levels in the room hits like 1200 i know that she's probably headache -y, right? yeah and it's interesting because before that you just treat that with advil now you open the window Right, and so it's pretty interesting that a lot of times um, we accept a headache as just something that happens and that you treat with Tylenol, Advil, or Tylenol and Advil, right? Yeah. Uh, when it could be as simple as like, hey, you need to get outside and go for a walk. Yeah. You've just been exposed to high levels of CO2. And again, it, it seems so foo-foo and so um, alternative that I think a lot of people just roll their eyes at the idea. Yeah. But my argument is, okay, but what's the downside of telling someone to go for a walk? Right, like it's so, you know, you're gonna immediately jump to just take town. Though I'm saying going mm -hmm. go for a walk first, and I'm the crazy one. So how about we do this? They go for a walk for 15 minutes. They come back. If half an hour later they still have a headache, then they can self medicate. Exactly. Right? Try that first. The hardest thing is often getting over that placebo effect, though, that they'll yeah. experience, because of course 
they don't link it to the thing they can't see. Well, you, you can only test it if you're measuring it. So if you're not measuring it, it, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. So it, that's, that's the hard part with all of, of health is that, you know, if sunlight and CO2 levels are contributing factors, and they're, but they're not being measured in your trial and somehow they affect one group more than the other, mm-hmm. you know, it, you're, you're not going to see that in your conclusions because it's not part of what you analyze. So it is, it is the one problem with delving, diving deep into the broader picture of health yeah. and fitness is that it exposes all these other areas where you're like, oh, that was never considered, right? So when you talk about all the things you regressed out, um, was that so a good great example mediterranean diet is now more the mediterranean lifestyle which is more the mediterranean way of life which may also just be living in the mediterranean yeah right and, so and we didn't measure, siesta. yeah we measured olive oil intake and fruits and vegetables we didn't measure time outside the fa- fact that they fast all the time but time outside uh, co2 levels um oh the time spent with friends and family in those situations i mean all that yeah. stuff really really important and but we can't really measure it as well or we couldn't at the time we're much better at it now so we just didn't we put a wall around what we were measuring we went with our assumptions it's probably the olive oil intake the monounsaturated fats and fruit and vegetable intake and and red wine Mm because we need good evidence that that works because we want to drink it (laughs) and then box that off from everything else and i don't don't know if you can't right the in fact the it would be really interesting, a lot of the red wine info from the old um, Mediterranean diet research, mm-hmm. how much of that is simply because they're drinking with friends and family and how much of it is that they're drinking. Right? So exactly. I mean, that's with, I would say, you know, your state, of course, if you're under less stress, okay, and I actually wanted to bring this up when we're talking about the gut health and everything. Yeah. You see people who go to the Mediterranean on a vacation, yeah. they have no stress. Yeah. We were talking about the person who goes to Mexico with that. They eat all this bread, they lose weight. Yep. And they're like, man, over there, it's just the best ever. And we it's joke like, about that, yeah. Caribbean, same thing. We joke about it when people go down. Um, we, we visit some of the islands of the Caribbean regularly. Yeah. And they probably lost some weight. And like, it must be the rum, right? It has nothing to do with the, you know, the fresh air, the sunlight, the activity, the friends and family, right? No, it's, it's definitely something you eat down there, right? Yeah. So um, go ahead. Did you do any study into, you know, everyone is gluten intolerant or has some gluten yeah. going on nowadays, but when they go over there, they do eat bread and they're like, it's the non-GMO. It's, did yeah. you do any? No, no. Um, I've actually, the gluten research is so specific and it's so pathway oriented that it's an area that's hard for me to dive into because I'm just so far yeah. behind. Right. So I'll just defer to people who actually spent their life and thousands of dollars getting degrees in that one specific area. Cause it's just far outside of mine. I find that um, whether or not you, I'm going to say buy in with, without seeming too derogatory to the whole gluten idea. The main thing is people are having problems with their stomachs, their guts right now. Mm-hmm. Um, the bloating I'm seeing people have in relation to what they've eaten is a level of bloating that they told me that's what was happening. I wouldn't believe them. But when you actually see it, you're like, you, you have a baby. Like you have yeah. a baby coming in. And then, then they talk about how much it hurts and how tight it is. That regardless if it's the gluten or what it is, we know they have, there's something going on that needs to be addressed because mm-hmm. no one should have to live like that after every meal. So just doing elimination diets and that sort of thing. I, hopefully, I mean, that's again, going on the assumption it's the food, right? And not something else. To exactly. Trigger. But it's, it's worth looking into because you can't deny these people are in some sort of pain mm-hmm. and that needs to be dealt with somehow. So do we know if uh, organs get Pavlovian conditioning? So, so here's where I'm going with this. If someone's eating and every time they eat, they're under pressure or stress, yep. and that organ's learning over and over again to bloat because we're teaching it, through the different things that are happening in the first time that that event happened, they bloated from eating. So then it's like, Oh, cool. Every time this happens, I bloat. And so it's like literally unteaching the dog to be scared of the, or to salivate from the bell. Okay. So I think it's a sound theory. I think it's theory that definitely is, if not looked into, needs to be looked into. I know that 
uh, believe it or not, from my days in the supplement industry, the, the company I worked for was basically full of bodybuilders. Yeah. I remember two things was one guy had to have, Jay, Jay had to have water tap <laughs> on while he was eating tuna. You could not eat tuna unless you had like running water beside him because of the reaction he was getting from having five cans of tuna a day or whatever it was. Oh. And then I knew another guy who would like break in the sweats at the thought of his next meal because he was so tired of like, he, he bulked up from like, you know, a 205 guy to like a 275 guy. And it was like, it was the anticipation of meals causing him this like sweaty anxiety. It was horrible. Yeah. So I, I think there's, I've never looked into it, but I really like the theory and I think it deserves some attention. Uh, like a Pavlo, I'm, I'm sure based on the idea that you can, you know, circadian rhythms can be trained with food. Um, I wouldn't doubt that that's actually highly possible. Yeah. That is something that I always think about, like people get trained so much and we don't realize like everything. It's like the reason that your parents, you're so how you are because of your parents. Yeah. You saw them do things. Yeah. And then, like, if they yelled at you around meals, who knows? Like, you just build this huge. Yeah, well, that gets right back to the parent thing of, you know, I'm worried about Jimmy's weight. I want him to eat healthy, but God damn it, he better finish that food on his weight. Right? Like, you, you know what? You don't get dessert until you finish the rest of the food. Because <laughs> that's logical, right? Like, that's yeah. good parenting, right? It's like, you know, and I, you know, what was the one when I was young? It's like, there are starving kids in Ethiopia. And then you're like, I will send them this food. I do not want it, right? So the uh yeah so that that conditioning is is definitely like definitely there right yeah. so it's um and then it's just how far can you take that because you're right from from a obvious pavlonian conditioning of just your emotions towards food if that can actually dive deep enough that it's into the the how your organs react to the food that'd be super curious to see totally. that yeah so okay so on heightened living i have something that i like to call higher leverage skills you've heard of you know a higher leverage thing yeah. uh, higher leverage skill is basically uh a skill that can be learned in let's say any field yeah. and applied to multiple fields so i say breathing is a higher leverage skill because if you breathe correctly everything you do is better right. learning to learn you can learn better is there any skills that you've learned that have helped you in research and getting to where you are today that you would coin as higher leverage it can be a mindset. It can be a mental paradigm of thought, but it's just something that you could be like, Oh, cool. I use this every time that I do this or by doing this, everything became easier. Right. That's a great question. Let me, let me, let me ponder. Yeah. This a I think a lot of it is, um, a way of, of looking at facts so, and I, and I I'll, I'll equate it back to like gossip. So when something in your, in your local community happens, mm -hmm. right, you will spend a great deal of time trying to, trying to think about why um, Stacy's mom did what she did. And you, mm -hmm. you don't know why you're just thinking about why. And then, Oh my God, if she did it because of this, well then I don't like that because of this. And if she doesn't like that, then I don't know where we're in it. And you just sort of all of a sudden you and Stacy's mom are having this like, dialogue back and forth about parenting skills yeah and you have no idea why that happens so more often than not um the reason things that happen aren't as malicious or as um dastardly as you may think mm -hmm. um, you know when it comes down to even politicians and, and you know the evil things they're doing and i'm like dude they're not that right you know, yeah. I don't think, no, they, they don't, they're, I, I, I wish our politicians were so forward thinking that they're, you know, they did this in 1980, so this could happen in 95, so this would happen in 2000, all to get to what's happening in 2020. I'm like, yeah. they're not that smart. <laughs> no offense. Like, yeah. not that. So I think in, in general, one of the things is realizing that when you, when you have pinned things pinned down to not a cause and effect, but, and this happens a lot in health and fitness, but to malicious intent versus benevolent intent mm -hmm. like this hormone up is good and this hormone down is bad i think you're missing you're missing the point right and it's yeah. never we're very quick as humans to all of a sudden decide which is good on or off which is good up or down right and it's mm -hmm. it's rarely a good versus evil malicious versus benevolent and it's just sort of what's happening 
accepting that you're really just looking at what's happening and, and a, a snapshot, a snippet of what's actually happening yeah. really allows you to explore it uh, more thoroughly and with a much larger, um, larger open mind, much more open mind. There we go. Yeah. Then if you decide, okay, so, um, uh, lipo, like protein lipase is the enzyme that's responsible for allowing fat into a cell. Um, therefore, it's bad. Yeah. Hold okay. on. It's, it's bad in the adipocyte and only bad in means that it lets fat in. But considering, you know, the fatty acids have to enter a muscle cell in order to be oxidized, if that's what you're after. Yeah. Is it, so it's, it's, it's bad and good specifically. And really, you know, if the fatty acids couldn't enter your fat cell, you would see other probably worse um, complications. So is it really bad, right? Like it's, yeah. it's only bad because you want abs, right? And you've, <laughs> so it, it, if you remove that whole idea of things are done um, with these malicious or benevolent intents and, and just be like, that's just what happens. Why does it happen? And then yeah. just build out from there. Um, I think it's easier to get a much larger and broader understanding of what's really going on. Totally. So I think that, that then applies to, um, science in terms of like pathways and then up from the pathways you can look at why people eat the way they do to then why people treat other people the way they do you know so with um, body shape stigmas etc then all the way down to parenting and everything else if you just try to really refrain from jumping to the um, good bad um, intense yeah and happening and just pay attention to more what is happening you're much better off and it's much less stress in your day-to-day -day interactions um i'm a great example is i would say 80 percent because we always use 80 20 the you know the, the person who cut you off didn't do it on purpose yes. where is okay there is a saying it's a like a zen saying and it was something i'm gonna butcher the crap out of this but basically you're in your boat and another boat runs into you and you're like this river is giant you must be the biggest idiot to manage to run into my boat when i'm the only other person out here and you turn around and there's no one in the boat there you go never mind yeah it, this boat was adrift yeah right? because it happened completely through happenstance and a boat just drifted into you there's no stress there's no anger there's nothing but for a brief period of time where you thought someone steering that boat had run into you you obviously thought they did it on purpose with, with bad intentions or mm -hmm. just really, really dumb and all that. All right. So same thing with, you know, when you, when you get really worked up over someone who, you know, maybe they didn't even cut you off. They kind of just sort of made you think for a second in your car and you're like, screw you for making me almost touch my brake. Right. So yeah. it's getting over that and realize these, these things aren't done with the intent you automatically jump to uh, helps in life, helps with your ability to interpret data helps just in general. That is, you brought, I mean, in that you had a ton, which is like seeing events as neutral, not bad or good. Yeah. Uh, cor uh, context versus content. Oh, uh, man, that is, but that's a, a, a way to see the world, which we Yeah, it's hard to do. I don't know why we jump. I, it might be, um, I mean, if you think about growing up watching TV and movies, there's good guys and bad guys. And the bad guys do bad things, the good guys do good things. Sometimes the good guys have to do bad things, but with a good, and it's never just, things happening right yeah. so um I was, I, was, I was joking with my kids that like you know that the empire probably didn't realize they're doing anything wrong right like darth vader had intentions there right like it's you know the, yeah. all the little stormtroopers are just doing their job sort of thing right so but it is yeah but we get trained to think in terms of uh, intentions and you know benevolent people malicious people and really it's it's probably not sometimes it is yeah. right you really better be sure when you're going to make that accusation because just thinking more neutral uh yeah. just yeah. yeah one of the uh the movies that i always want to be made is i want it to be from a henchman's point of view so like yeah. he, but it's just his point of view the whole movie so all this stuff is going on and it's like the beginning of his day it's just like a regular day and he like yeah. goes on to do stuff and then like his boss gets blown away and like all this stuff is happening and he's just like you just get to hear all of his mental chatter of like does the henchman just like die off you don't know their name but like this guy is He's like, I'm going to get it this time. I'm yeah. going to show the boss who's, yeah. Okay, so here's a crazy segue for you. I think the only way to do a good Batman movie, because yeah. you know, we have such a, a love of that character, he'll never be done right. 
should almost be a Friday the 13th style where it is a, a group of henchmen. Yeah. Pulled off a heist and now they're being like stalked by this like evil thing. And, and in the end, it's actually Batman catching them. Right? That would be it's cool. Like, don't really, he's scary as hell. You don't see him. He jumps out of the corner. You know those, those like um, Friday 13th movies where all yeah. of a sudden one of the guys just disappears, right? Only it was like Batman got him. And so in the end, you realize that the evil thing hunting them is the good guy, right? Yeah. He's just actually capturing them because they're a bunch of bad diamond thieves. So a way to do Batman that's never been done before because then the focus isn't on the character that we will never get done properly, right? Like yeah. he's, he's too perfect in the way he's yeah. written the expectations of him that even you know no matter how many iterations of him no one's gonna be happy with the suit or the actor or the motives mm -hmm. etc so to your point yeah just flip it on everybody so you think that the the malicious actor is actually the the, the benevolent actor right and yeah so flipping switches but call it the, should be named the bat yeah shadow the bat something like that exactly yeah. right so it'd be a really cool way to look at it that would be that is awesome. So I'm going to segue again. We yeah. can put the tinfoil hat back on. Yeah. What are you currently questioning? We kind of like what you said your higher leverage skill is, is kind of similar. Yeah. And also the CO2 thing, but this is something I guess globally, like, or internally or life, but like something that you're just like, it doesn't work that way. Or yeah. I don't think it's like that. Without becoming your, you know, environmental, activist um, mm -hmm. it is the role of environment in and then you know because the, the vanity comes into play i always tie it back to sort of obesity and and um your body so i got interested in longevity for a bit and it's a very hard area to research because defining it you really really realize that for a lot of us it's we don't want to live to 200 we just want to live longer better right mm -hmm. so I would just like to have a much better 70s than maybe my grandparents did, right? And then, you know, they probably had a much better 70s than their grandparents because their grandparents didn't even make it to 70s. So I want to, I'm interested in that, but I realize that is more, um, that's a lifestyle thing. It's a, it's a staying active, it's a stress. I don't doubt that, I mean, you look at kids in the gym, and I'm using the term kids, I mean like, you know, the 18-year-old guys. Yeah. And he's like, holy, you, you have figured out building muscle and getting lean, right? Like if anybody in my high school years looked like you, they would be yeah. the shredded, awesome big guy. And yet you and all your friends look that way. So we've come to the point where I think we've got that down. Um, we're becoming more and more aware of injury prevention and, and what the minimum effective dose is for exercise. So I don't doubt that that generation, as opposed to my generation, like so people in their forties and the guys who came before me in their fifties and sixties who are just, broken human beings from just years of just grinding away like powerlifting. Mm -hmm. These kids are getting similar results, but maybe without the effort and the wear and tear are going to have less injuries. And that will contribute to a better 50s, 60s, 70s with less body fat, with less muscle is once we get a hold of the stress side of it. Totally. Which I think, you know, for, for every um, shot taken at the millennials type of thing, I think they've, they're starting to kind of figure a lot of that out mm -hmm. that, half the stuff their parents do just isn't really worth it. Um, it's going to come into questioning. I always joke about the idea of like success and success coaches. Yeah. If you actually look at the definition of success, it means you're done, right? So if you're still chasing money, you're not actually successful. You're wealthy and you're good at making money. But to me, to be successful, mm -hmm. you're done, right? Yeah. You've got enough money and you've stopped this race. It, but that never happens. And we, don't, we define people who are successful it's like, oh, look how much money they're making. Not they've made, they're making. And then you realize successful people are really just like gilded lilies, right? They're just adding, you know, the cars and the lifestyle and stuff to something that's already good. Like you should have just quit. Yeah. And I think a lot of the millennials are, are figuring that out. They're like, well, hold on. Like the, the definition of success get handed down to us is, is really wrong. Right. And this idea of just chasing money and, and building an empire and leaving a legacy is just sort of like, it's, it's almost um, a perversion of the, you know, 1990s alpha, you know, if you can't be Rambo or, or Rocky, this is how you do it, right? This is, you, you, you become the man doing it this way. And I think a lot of people are moving away from that, 
So that is an area that needs research, as is um, environment and its role in stress. I just watched a really cool small documentary mm-hmm. about clutter and how the clutter in your house and like this room's a bloody yeah. mess I, I actually affects you emotionally. Who is it by? Pardon me. Who is it by? I will look it up and I will I'll pass it over to you. Is it Maria Kondo? Could possibly be. The, she wrote the art of tidying up. No, no, it was it was that got that in the direction. This was actually really cool. They, I want to say they are archaeologists or anthropologists or something along those yeah. lines. But they went into people's houses, categorized every single thing in that house where it was and what it was. So like an inventory of someone's house. And it was insane, the, the cluttered life of the middle class, something along those lines. I'll, I'll get the link, it was, it's only a couple of minutes and it's based off a book, it's worth reading. But they were saying that even you could measure the effects physically in terms of elevated cortisol levels, right? And I'm, I'm very affected by the clutter in my house, it drives mm-hmm. me like bonkers, right? Yeah. I need a clean desk to write and I need, um, you know, I like going to coffee shops for social solitude because it's, it's not my clutter. It's a space that I just can work at. And so I think that your environment, whether it's the, the clutter you live in or, or the CO2 levels or the lack of sunlight, like all of these things, the people you interact with or don't interact with, mm-hmm. um, it, it all comes into play. So even this interaction you and I are having now um, virtually was not nearly the same if, if we had gotten together at a coffee shop, like yeah. in terms of our own stress and connection and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's an interesting area of health that I think will play into longevity and happiness research is, is just time spent with friends and family, possibly not in your 16 foot by 12 foot <laughs> or the cell that is a bedroom or a living room. Um, breathing in your own recycled CO2, which by the way, the, the, the carbon in your CO2, a lot of it comes from your body fats. You're literally just breathing back in. Your... <laughs> anyway, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so I think we need that. That will be an area where we start realizing that the, the deep, deep dives into, um, you know, the, the different types of mTOR and how mTOR and AKT causes muscle growth, but not always. And then holy crap, mTOR is also an adipose. And we're just gonna keep diving deeper and deeper in these protein signaling pathways. And at one point we're gonna sit there going like, okay, why? Holy crap, why are we yeah. looking at all this? right? When you step really far back and you know, you start looking at true longevity research, true happiness research, and then even body fat and obesity research on a much larger scale. And you start looking at like, wow, we just we're living wrong not not to go too yeah. not really stoic as much as like epicurean but just yeah. like you know high spent with friends and family are probably of the utmost importance and and simple pleasures not like hedonistic you know orgy type stuff but just like yeah. the simple pleasures of of the sun on your face and going for walks and all that really does matter and when you see interviews with your centurion i said it wrong one's a horse one we live past 100. So people, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and that's the kind of things they talk about. I mean, yes, sometimes they, they say things like, you know, it's actually the gin that kept me alive. Yeah. But really, you see outlook of life and you see family and you see time spent outdoors and all kinds of cool stuff that I think it's, if you treat it like a true science and you don't go too, I used the term foo foo, but you know what I mean, like too, yeah. that too quickly, but as a true study of the effects, um, we're going to see some pretty outstanding things that are really going to make us rethink how we live. Yeah. I think it's, well, you can't great. I know I've tangent and I'm, I'm really, yeah. off. I love it. I love it. Well, I, I get invited every so often to like masterminds, right? And so people in our industry who get together and a lot of these masterminds are people who've made like amounts of money that I don't really even comprehend. And so you're sitting in these room with these people who've made, ton just a ton of money and you ask them about their two or three year plan and it's always to make a ton more money it's a 10x right i can't be happy with 10 million i need 100 million right yeah and you ask them about their, their plans a bit far as down the future and it's still then they kind of start talking about maybe their legacy then you talk to them about their end goal and it always always is something along the lines of it's what you know 
I'm like, we're tired to a house by the water, you know, and I was <laughs> And it's like, well, you can do that right now. You can buy a small island and you can do that yeah. now, right? Every once in a while, someone talks about like mountain instead, but almost always it's, it's a place by the water. And I think yeah. it's just an analogy for what we really want is some level of serenity. And yes. we're convinced that all you need is way more money than you have now to get it. And what people don't realize is that you can, you can have it now. Right, like, but you don't want change at the same time. So kind of like how I always say, people don't want to lose weight; they want to weigh less. Yeah, the whole idea of, of serenity is people do they really do want serenity and they want a place by the water, but they don't want to leave the exact house they're in now and the exact city they're in now. You know, they they like to dream about these things. Yeah, you don't want to grasp it. And and what worries me is then if you're presented with your end goal right in front of you and you don't actually grab it. I don't think it's really your end goal. No. Um, and then I think you're lying to yourself, right? So may, maybe your goal, I think everybody ultimately decides serenity and, and that kind of relaxed life is what they want. But when you offer to a lot of people right now, they don't take it because they're not done winning, mm -hmm. right? And it's no, but I haven't made more money. It's not just more money. I need to more, make more, more money than that guy, right? And it's just like weird um, way we compete and prove ourselves and just define our success with more even though the definition of success is being done gathering yeah. more right yeah. so you know success isn't success is when you cross the line in a marathon success isn't i've actually been running this marathon for 14 weeks yeah right? it's, it's, it's it's we've really got it messed up so but i think that serenity that that house by the water it's, there's a giant untapped area of research and it might not be untapped i might just yeah rare of it might just be ignorant to it but it's an area that needs to start seeping in more and more to health and fitness um, mm -hmm. because it health and fitness can't just be abs or no abs right it's such a no. myopic way of looking at it that um there's just more to it so i think that would be the area that i'll I'll, event, I'll keep trying to explore it's just hard to do yeah yeah that so there's so i think success needs to be replaced with fulfillment yeah right even at that, um, so if you study the three types of time, there's chronological, biological, experiential. Okay. And I think all of it comes down to experiential time. If, you're, if you get to 70 and you have all these amazing experiences and you remember being with friends and family and you loved it, I think by focusing on that, that's how you become, you have the serenity, the peace, because you have like a layered, I don't know if it's like the brain feels more mm -hmm. like look at all these amazing memories like we had, or if it's just, you actually did the things that make a human happy yeah. and your brain remembers it. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like, you know, obviously you and I like to explore intellectually. Yeah. Maybe human is just meant to explore in general. Right. So physically as, as well. And, and so, yeah, that could be, I like, that's a really Cool way of looking at time i actually haven't heard of before um, really yeah but very very cool i'll like, send you a, a video where he breaks down how to increase your experiential time based on setting events in the future and doing a few things that like make it feel like when there's that car accident you can remember the whole minute like it was an hour right okay to make life more like that and really like milk the most out of it yeah, very cool very cool yeah. And other than that, is there anything that you've been obsessed with lately? We've got off on a lot of obsessions, but more like everything. And so, okay. So from a training standpoint, I'm still obsessed with, um, should it be effortful or effortless, right? Should physical training be like brushing your teeth, something you do every day, mm -hmm. or should it be something you do three times a week, but super high intensity, right? Should you know, where is the appropriate analogy or metaphor there? I mean, you don't brush your teeth on Mondays until your gums are bleeding, then brush them again on Wednesdays and Fridays, and that's it. You brush them a couple times a day, mm -hmm. just to get the job done. So where is the, where is that dose response and what is it? So can you get away with, um, you know, yeah. training is just so interesting to me. I, I look at the, I was just talking with somebody that's actually a strong man. And I realized that some of the most fun I've ever had training was in university with a, a guy named Jer. And we used to like 
you know, we lifted weights, obviously, but we also like pushed cars. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just fun. And it was a bunch of guys doing something really dumb and obviously getting a lot of attention because they're pushing a car around a, like a, yeah. uh, <laughs> like a local community full of students. Right. And it was just, it was a good time. And, you know, it's hard to recapture that camaraderie base, um, lifting weights and pushing cars is like, it's effortful, but effortless at the same time. It's just mm-hmm. forward, right? Like just push this car forward. Um, and why doesn't Jared weigh less? Because holy crap, he's steering it and he's heavy, right? Yeah. So it was like 270 and I was like 180, right? So it's like, when I'm driving, I'm like, this is not fair. It's like 100 pounds left. Totally. But anyway, that was just fun. And I, you know, recapturing that level of play in, in yeah. your workouts is kind of something the strongman have, right? It's just sort of like, there's an, it's a high effort, but effortless at the same time. It's a farmer's walk. Just pick it up, keep your body in right position, just go. Yeah. Right? And then you have these super high effort things like a, a clean and jerk where it's like, no, it's got to be like technically perfect or you're going to blow apart. And so it's just, it's figuring out that component of, of training. Totally. It, it gets me a bit obsessed. Uh, diet, I'm almost the opposite. I, I, it's hard to care yeah. about it because there's so many factors at play and there's so much you can tell people that you're just not going to do. Yeah. Because I think that how you eat is so entrained in your way of life that I, I think any changes you're going to make are going to be minor for a, in a couple of weeks. Some people, like the small percentage of people who can make giant changes in their diet usually make giant changes in their way of life too. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's, it's sort of a broader one, but training I find fascinating. And then, um, you know, there's, there's lots in the, our assumptions. So, you know, the data on BMI and everybody's like BMI sucks because it doesn't measure muscle. It just measures, you know, size. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, but the correlation was still there. Right. So is being, having an obese BMI, but because you're just a ton of muscle somehow naturally and, and you're 12% body fat, does that really decrease risk long-term? I don't, I don't, everybody would say it's obvious it does, but I don't know. Right. Because it'd be interesting. Can there be a muscle obesity? I don't know, be interesting to look into it, right? So we have a lot of assumptions we very quickly make. Uh, another one I'm very curious on is giving protein recommendations per pound of body weight. It makes no, no sense to me whatsoever because if you're, let's do the 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram, right? <laughs> Fine. So 160 grams of protein for a 220 pound man. Okay, so I'm a... Six foot four, lean, athletic NHL player who weighs 220 pounds. I'm, I'm pretty much, not only my 220 pounds of muscle, but I have a six foot four person's organs. They're obviously bigger than the other person who's a five foot six male with 35% body fat mm-hmm. and, and comparatively smaller organs. But we require the same amount of protein. It's, it doesn't, and I get, I get the argument back is, well, how else would you recommend it to the average population? And I'm convinced that height is probably, for the average population, a better predictor of overall lean body mass than just weight. Oh, yeah. So, so why not just do, okay, recommend your protein based on centimeters, inches of height rather than weight, unless you can show me that adipose tissue needs protein as well or somehow affects Yeah. That. I- um, so assumptions. I, I like really looking at assumptions and why we make them. So. I love that. That seems like a big, uh, both with what you were saying with your high leverage skill yep. and just like all life, don't assume because it makes an ass out of you and me. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Brad. This was awesome. I oh, love diving in. all over the place. So sorry about all the tangents. And- no, that's honestly... I love an organic conversation where like I now have all these different places to go explore. So perfect. I'm glad I could help. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you so much, man. And I'm sure we'll talk soon. Absolutely.